We can't argue because you're really here. So. <laughs> Give that introduction because I'm no good at introducing things. So um, I just wanted to thank Pierre Zia and um, Christopher and and Peter, the absent Peter, and Alia, everybody for inviting us. Um, so I'm just going to start with the first chapter. It's called "To Fall Asleep." I'm falling asleep. I'm falling into sleep, and I'm falling there by the power of sleep. Just as I fall asleep from exhaustion, just as I drop from boredom, as I fall on hard times, as I fall in general, sleep sums up all these falls. It gathers them together. Sleep is proclaimed and symbolized by the sign of the fall, the more or less swift descent or sagging faintness. To these we can add how I'm fainting from pleasure or from pain. This fall in its turn in one or another of its versions, mingles with the others. When I fall into sleep, when I sink, everything has become indistinct, pleasure and pain, pleasure itself and its own pain, pain itself and its own pleasure. One passing into the other produces exhaustion, lassitude, boredom, lethargy, untying, unmooring. The boat gently leaves its moorings and drifts. The pain of pleasure comes when pleasure can no longer bear itself. It's when it gives itself up and stops allowing itself solely to enjoy, jouir. Exhausted lovers fall asleep. The pleasure of pain is when pain insists, not without perversity, that it should be sustained and savored even, while it grows increasingly inflamed. It's when it revels, if only in its own lament. It doesn't just let itself struggle and protest against the pain. By itself, it agrees to fall asleep in a way, in the sense that we say, put the pain to sleep, even if it means enduring a dreadful reawakening. In any case, faintness and falling consist in not allowing a state to persist with the tension natural to it, a state of tension, then, that is not a state. With its tension and its intention slackening, giving up, activity into fatigue, interest into boredom, hope or confidence into distress, pleasure into displeasure, rejection of pain into morose delectation of it, keenness becomes dull, momentum is lost, an alertness falls asleep. An alertness falls asleep, that is how from all quarters we are led or led back, toward the motif of sleep as soon as any kind of faintness is expressed, as soon as any renunciation appears, an abandon, a decrease or a retreat of intentionality under any of its forms. An alertness falls asleep, for by definition, it is only alertness that can fall asleep. Wakefulness alone can give way to sleep, and wakefulness preserved stems from sleep refused, sleepiness refused. The sentinel must struggle against sleep, as does Aeschylus's watchman on the roof, as Christ's companions forget to do. Whoever relinquishes vigilance relinquishes attention and intention, every kind of tension and anticipation. He enters into the unraveling of plans and aims, of expectations and calculations. It is this loosening that gathers together, actually or symbolically, the fall into sleep. This fall is the fall of attention. It is a relaxation that is not content with an inferior, limited degree of tension, but that sinks down toward an infinitesimal proximity to degree zero, until that underlying closeness to simple inertia that we know in the bodies of sleeping infants, which we sometimes recognize when on the edge of sleep, we can feel that we are beginning to stop feeling the basic energy of our bodies. We feel the suspense of feeling, we feel ourselves falling. We feel the fall. Mm. 
we fall from sleep into sleep. Sleep is itself a force that precedes itself and that carries its power forward into its action. If I'm falling asleep, it's because already sleep has begun to take control of me and invade me even before I sleep, before I've begun to fall. We say that sleep conquers us, it gains on us, it extends its hold and its shadow with a discretion and constancy that are those of the evening, of dust, of age. This antecedence of sleep can be prolonged indefinitely. Thus, ancient monuments do not, strictly speaking, sleep, but they are plunged into somnolence, into a drowsiness that stems from their abandonment, the prime example of which has long been the Sphinx of Giza, along with the statues on Easter Island. Neither our curiosity nor our admiration can awaken the gods, the princes, the conquerors, or the crowds made to labor or pray for their celebrations. As we say in French, these monuments are désaffectés, disused, deconsecrated. They are emptied of their responsibilities and, with them, emptied of the affects they once roused. The pyramids of Egypt or Mexico, imperial or royal palaces, temples and cathedrals keep being conquered by a sleep that can neither put them completely to sleep nor consign them to a free existence as ruins that could have another life, a metamorphosis, even a metempsychosis, as happens when the ruin is content to sink down and become part of its landscape or some other construction without penetrating into monumental memory. But sleep is not metamorphosis. At the very most, it could be understood as an endomorphosis, as the internal formation or the formation of an interiority where the interior, sealed, seemed wholly projected into the intentions and extensions of wakeful existence. Internal formation, but without a transformation of being. Temporary endomorphosis forever suspended on the limits of form itself. Formation of an amorphous, hard to identify substance whose most common and well-defined aspect is precisely none other than that of the fall, of sagging and unfastening, the prostrate posture of the god Morpheus. And I'm going to skip a uh, little to near the end. Uh, this chapter is called The Soul That Never Sleeps. Never, however, never does the soul sleep. That absenting of self and self is unknown to it, Absence belongs to the body and to the mind. It is foreign to the soul. In sleep, the mind abandons itself to the body and disperses its location through it, dissolves its concentration into that soft, almost disjointed expanse. The body, for its part, abandons itself paradoxically to the very location of the mind. It is no longer actually exposed in space, but implicitly or virtually withdrawn into a non-place, where it anesthetizes itself and separates itself from the world. The person who sleeps is a mental body or a bodily mind, one lost in the other, and in both cases, in both aspects, a subject extravasated, aspirated, exposed or existing in the strongest and most problematic senses of these words. In this, the sleeper is always twofold. He, she is himself, herself, and another, their very sex is undecided, then, more deeply than it is ever so in other conditions, for sleep seduces itself and takes pleasure in itself, which is not in itself. But the soul animates sleep as well as waking. The soul is both sleeping and vigilant, and for that very reason it does not sleep, nor is it awakened. In waking it is that which ceaselessly dozes, in sleeping it is that which wakes and watches, from all quarters, Every time, it is that which, giving form and tonality to a presence, adheres to the edges, to the outlines. Not indeed like a skipper in his ship, but spread throughout the entire expanse of the body and mingled with it so that simultaneously at every point it is like a signal, like a lantern, like a lookout on top of a tall mast, or like a seated seagull on the taffrail. It is like a St. Elmo's fire, or like a brilliant moonbeam on copper or like a message thrown into the sea, or else like a radio antenna capturing a call for help from another boat set adrift by its failing engines, or like the glint of the sun or the lenses of the binoculars in which the image appears of a shabby old tub loaded with boat people who are dying, 
falling from misery and fear, falling, fallen into a sleep that no longer sleeps, into a dreary lethargy of woe. The soul models and modulates the form of the sleeper as well as that of the waker. It receives in the midst for both of them the signals from the rest of the world, but also signals from the other, from the sleeper huddled inside the waker, from the waker circling inside the sleeper. It keeps the one who wakes from abandoning himself to all the slings and arrows of the day. It blinks his eyelids and makes him share the beneficial forgetfulness so necessary to the pursuit of works and days. It maintains the one who sleeps in a state that perceives emergency signals and ruminates over his most intimate thoughts. It is not insomniac, the soul, quite the contrary. It is indeed the soul that sleeps without the sleep of the sleeper and that wakes with the wakefulness of the one awake. It is the soul that watches in the midst of sleep and that sleeps only in waking. It is the watch itself that divides between night and day, between vigilant watchfulness and somnolent watchfulness. It itself is the rhythm. It is the gently dancing shadow that keeps watch all the time over the possibility of alternation and rocking, over this turn by turn without which we would be either dead or else would be living beings standing stiff in their heroic posture, like that Socrates able to spend the whole night standing up. Vigilance itself, the idea bright without shadow and also without music. But we have to keep watch. We have to keep watch when even the soul would like to go to sleep. In the end, it has to stop watching over sleep. Ambulances tear through the night and cannons and rocket launchings, children crying, tanks rumbling, rending pains in the chest, in the bellies of the cancerous or the wounded, harsh light of the lamps that one cannot or will not turn off, obsessive thoughts, torments, remorse, feverish anticipations, fears, fears more than anything else fears of everything. Sleep presupposes the fear of night has been conquered, but night is the wilderness of fears. The figures that day arranges for recognition rise up again from the darkness disguised in evil masks. The thoughts we know how to manage carefully burst into anxieties, suffocations, aporias that close over and over unto themselves as long as day has not dissolved them. Night engenders terror, obsession, ravage, and panic. It is not a matter of insomnia, which is a wandering from sleep itself, its transformation into a wakefulness deprived of day, into a glowing nightlight whose gleam maintains the agitation of the soul with a clear awareness of sleep usurped, split open, transformed into its twofold awakening. On the contrary, it is a matter of the world in which it is impossible to sleep, of the world in which it is forbidden to sleep, because of a process of torture whose effectiveness is not in doubt. It is possible that the world today is that way, without sleeping or waking. Sleeping standing up, waking while dozing, sleepwalking and somnolent. World deprived of rhythm, world that has deprived itself of rhythm, that has stripped away from itself the possibility of seeing its days and its nights correspond to the system of nature or history. <coughs> Migrating birds at night are thrown off course by the intense halo of light that big cities project into the sky. They are ready to go to sleep anywhere, thinking they have reached sunny climes. World in shambles, out of balance, uneven enough to make sleep itself devastated by unevenness. Sleepers harassed, always on the alert, less fallen asleep than thrown into sleep, precipitated by a numbness from short hours broken by knocking sounds in the head, knocks on the door, blows, or gunshots. Sleeper is not so much sleeping as knocked out, conquered at night as they were during the day, piled into camps, or lying in ditches, in trucks, or in skiffs, hunted, chased from their hurried repose. Nights shot through with the flashes of fire, of frenzy, of famine. Nights stripped of their very night, uprooted from darkness and shadow, thrown into the harsh light of a nuclear blinding, Sleeps that are nothing but parodies, caricatures of sleeps. Heads kept buried beneath muddy water, but kept from giving themselves over to the abandon of deep waters. <coughs> How to sleep in a world without a lullaby, without a lulling refrain, without a capacity for forgetting, 
without unconsciousness itself, since Eros and Thanatos patrol everywhere shamelessly, sardonic watchmen armed with whips and cudgels. How to sleep in a world hypnotized by the vision of its own absence of vision of the world, as well as by the inanity of all visions that have dissolved, but that always used to promise awakenings, triumphant mornings following splendid evenings, in the blaze of which night has been forever discredited. How to sleep, distraught soul, soul without soul, soul that floats lifeless over the field of battle or muck, whose inanity an operating room lamp garishly exposes. <coughs>